Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our podcast on Solid Ground. My name is Joe Boyle, and I'm joined with Jay Silver and David Grinley once again. So at Grinley Engineering, what does the process of soil testing entail, and why would someone need it for their new build? Like, what are the benefits of that? Yeah. Uh, a lot of a lot of entire neighborhoods, if there's a you know a tract of land that's being developed, uh, will typically have some sort of geotechnical testing done. Whether that's just for um, you know determining how much permeation the soil will have if rain falls on it, um, you know where does that water go? Does it absorb into the mm-hmm. soil? How fast does it absorb into the soil? And that'll help a civil engineer design an actual stormwater system for that neighborhood to you know, retain water. But you know, so geotechnic has been done on those bigger tracts of land, but what if it's a, a smaller, you know, individual property or a few properties uh, in close, con, you know, uh, proximity to one another? You know, that's where I think probably people don't typically do a whole lot of geotech. Mm-hmm. And um, what they can do is they can explore the soil, at least the shallow soil, if not, you know, something deeper, just to see if there are going to be some problematic you know, soil conditions there. I mean, in the prior podcast episode, we talked about clay. I mean, that's just one of the multiple things it could be, right? So um, those are the types of things that I think would be highly recommended, but a lot of people just don't want to go through the extra expense. Mm -hmm. Right, that makes sense. So after the soil testing is complete, what usually comes next in the process? Yeah, uh, so that once you know what soil conditions you, you are dealing with, whether it's organics or if it's just buried trash or something like that, a lot of the time it can just be cleaned off, scraped away, you know, done away with, uh, discarded or used somewhere else on the lot if it's a big enough lot. Um, but you definitely don't want to build a foundation on, you know, highly organic soil, for example. So scrape that out of there and get to a, a nice clean layer that you can work with. Um, but if it's a, a more area wide issue or there's you know things like clay, then a specific foundation to deal with those conditions has to be designed. So you can't just go in and assume that you're able to put a thickened edge monolithic Mm -hmm. slab, you know, to carry the weight of a two story building on it, because in all likelihood, it's going to have some settlement issues or Mm -hmm. heaving issues. If you, if you just take this sort of cookbook, like build it like everybody else approach. Right. And what are, what are some, um, some risks that people face that don't do a soil test or a soil study, whether they're building a, you know, two, $3 million custom home or they're building apartment complexes or office buildings and they decide, um, no, we're, we're just going to go with it without a soil test. Uh, what are some of the, the risks and um, problems that they may have down the road and what are the repercussions of, of not doing that up front? Worst case scenario, mm-hmm. your entire house gets dragged mm-hmm. into a sinkhole or something, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, that's the one that everyone obviously thinks yeah. about. Um, more often than not, it will just be some unpredictable amount of differential settlement, which will result in, mm-hmm. you know, cracks and, and unsightly, uh, issues, you know, damage to, to your house. And it could be as simple as, you know, there's buried tree stumps on the site, oh, some organics. You know, yeah. organics. It could be as simple as it was the last house built in a neighborhood. And that's where all the other contractors mm-hmm. dumped all their yeah. trash and buried it up. You don't want to build your house on top of that yeah. because it will settle and uh, the weight of your building is going to affect it. It could be an issue of just, you know, where does the water go? I mean, how well graded is it? But all of these things need to be accounted for um, when you're, you know, developing a house or built, you know, constructing a foundation. So um, just seriously needs to be considered. Right. And if there is a problem down the road, um, Maybe you could share with us, what are the comparisons of addressing that problem up front pre-construction before the structure is in place versus, oh, man, we didn't do soil testing. Now we have a problem, mm-hmm. the building sinking or differential settlement, those things that you kind of described, David. Yeah. Um, what are they looking at difference wise in cost um, to to fix the problem up front versus after the fact? So it's far more complex yeah. once there's yeah. already a building there. Right. Um you are now, if you, especially if it's a two-story building or something like that, and you've got to uh, consider interior load-bearing walls, interior load-bearing mm-hmm. foundations that are carrying your second story. Um, you know, and unfortunately, to do anything about that, now you've got to cut through your nice wood floors, yeah. your tile floors. You've got to remove all of that versus just having a head, heads up before you build the house and design a foundation specifically for it. So. Yeah, it's going to be costly either way, but far more complex 
when you've already got a structure in place and you've got to deal with uh, repairing all the finishes and things like that that you've caused damage to by trying to fix the foundation issue. So yeah, it's seriously considerably more cost. Again, just depends on the size of the house and mm-hmm. you know what we're dealing with, but right. yeah, the cost is clearly going to be higher. Okay. And in general term, ballpark, could that be double three times the cost once it's in place versus addressing maybe some weak organics or sinkhole conditions of, uh, up front? No question, yeah. Um, um, I'd, I'd say ballpark at least twice uh, the cost of mm-hmm. just doing. It's one of those an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure that situations, right? Yeah. So if you prevent the problem up front, you're going to save yourself time, money yeah. uh, for sure later. And, um, and yeah, and the cost will be dramatically higher. It's probably why I, in the commercial world, you, you see them always typically, I'm saying 90% or greater, they're always doing a soil study and a test yeah. versus when you come over the residential, even a high end custom home, sometimes they're doing it, sometimes they're not. And then in the track home building, um, you mentioned you were doing a large, large site, but we, we see track home builders, they don't typically do soil borings uh, or soil studies or yeah. tests. Um, why do you think that that is? Um, is it just due to the, the cost of it? Or is it, you know, I've always wondered why in commercial, we see it all the time. Soil studies are the, the standard. It's always done. And then in custom homes, much higher likelihood of doing it, but your kind of your your track home or your you know your your regular standard homes, they're not typically doing these studies. I think it largely comes this comes down to two things. One is always cost, right? I mean, it's going to cost more money to do a whole bunch of deeper borings to explore soil. Um, but the other one is, you know, some of these folks that built entire neighborhoods, especially back in the you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, mm-hmm. we're doing the same thing up north, places that don't have sinkholes, places that don't have the rain we have here, places that don't have Florida conditions to deal with. And so my guess would be that they essentially just took those bad, not necessarily bad practices, those northern practices, right. those non-Florida practices, yeah. and try to just do the same thing here. And of course, we saw what well, we have seen, homes falling into sinkholes, because yeah. things like that, that could have been tested or uh, been you know known ahead of time you know with a little bit of exploration um mm-hmm. but just weren't done yeah so. yeah so. yeah we see one right now that we're doing with uh tremel crow on uh, nebraska well that's going to be all new apartment complexes now and they did a thorough soil study on the site and they found three pockets where the buildings were going to go that were sinkhole related conditions mm-hmm. and we were out there we grouted that i think the the ballpark was uh around maybe 200,000 or so to remediate then. But if those buildings were in place, mm. it could have been yeah. 400, 500,000 to take care of if it was a and not a just legitimate that, but problem. Let's be honest. I mean, if a building collapses or partially collapses with people in it, mm. uh, the cost is far greater, right? Mm. I mean, that's, oh, yeah, that's, not, that's no longer a remediation. That's a loss of life, certainly a loss of a building. So, you know, that that's that's mm-hmm. what you're flirting with by not having yeah. some sort of pre, pre-construction testing being done. So, so for those audio, audience members out that are thinking about building a custom home or maybe they're building a uh, commercial building, um, you know, what ballpark, I know it depends a lot on the size and the scope, but are they from 5,000 to 10,000, 3,000 to five? What on a typical custom home, maybe a half acre, acre plot, 6,000 square foot house, mm-hmm. um, you know, what, what would they be looking at ballpark? And it sounds like to me, if you're putting that kind of money into a, a house to two million dollars or so, that to spend a little up front to have that peace of mind that the house is solid and you know you're not going to have any problems down the road would be well worth the 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 money spent. Yeah. If, if, so if it's an area where sinkhole activity is known to be a problem, uh, then I would I would encourage people to spend to have some deeper exploration done. Right. So that that is going to be a little more costly. If you happen to be in an area where there tends to not be sinkholes, but there could also be organics or it's an old swamp or something like that, uh, then shallow testing, you know, just of the near surface soils can be done for like two thousand dollars. It's not uh, it's not a whole yeah. lot to at least mm-hmm. get some idea of what you're about to build your house on. Right. Um, but there are some other non destructive sort of ways where, you know, using a good ground penetrating radar or electro resistivity mm-hmm. testing or something like that which again can be done for under 5,000, mm-hmm. uh, where at least you can get an idea if there's some downward 
raveling of soils that are referenced or indicated in those scans. Um, or very yeah. loose, weak soils that can help you determine maybe you need to go with a little larger size footer, yeah. continuous mm -hmm. wall footings. Yeah, exactly. Um, those are those are things that you know can also can all be determined mm -hmm. before, uh, and not necessarily for a huge expense. It, if you did see something in that ground penetrating radar survey that looked like it might be a sinkhole, that's probably when you bust out the the drill and you uh, you know explore a little deeper just to see what's really going on. Um, there's a little bit of a misnomer about what geophysics folks can see in those scans and in those GPRs. And it doesn't like show you like mm. the dead body mm. or whatever that you're looking for. <laughs> it just shows, you know, echoes on a, on a, uh, basically a screen. It shows like radar echoes. Mm. So you don't really know what it is. You just know there's something going on. And then the only way you know that what it is, is actually to, to excavate or to right. drill down. That's what I was mentioning to Joe. They, yep. they kind of use the GPR to identify potential areas um, where the house is going to go, areas of influence that could affect the, the foundation. And if they find something with the GPR, then what do you move to, a cone penetrating test or a soil uh, SPT? Yeah, either of those. So a CPT, a cone penetration test, is, is quicker to do, uh, but it doesn't necessarily give you the opportunity to sample uh, the material. There is a way to do it, but, you know, what, what's nice about the SPT, your standard penetration test, is that you're sampling the soil continuously throughout your boring. So you know exactly what the, so if a geologist comes along and sees all these little strata mm -hmm. of soil, they even track the color of the soil. They, you know, some of the guys actually taste it. I don't know. Oh, boy. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I like stream. Even the old, uh, you know, I don't know, test. Uh, they smell it. I, I mean, uh, there's geologists do geologist yeah. stuff and it's fun, but, um, yeah, I mean, all of that stuff you 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 know get from having a deep boring like an SPT or uh, at the very least a CPT, and, which is usually a little cheaper. And for yeah. those in the audience that don't necessarily know what an SPT, a soil mm -hmm. penetrating True. test, is or how it's done, could you maybe walk through a simple explanation of how that sampling spoon takes the the uh, the dirt and and how that that process works? Sure. Yeah. So there's a a rig that you probably, if you've ever driven on the interstate and seen um, these things out in the in the median, where they're determining mm -hmm. if uh, you know they can build a bridge there or whatever, it's a, it's like a it's like a mini drill rig that uh, people can take right onto the lot, the lot and just drive it up on a truck or sometimes it's on little treads and they can move it around. And essentially, what they do is they put a big probe in the ground with a a sampler we call a spoon on the bottom of it mm -hmm. uh, that will enable you to uh, retrieve some soil from whatever depth you're going. So they take that bit off, they drill down, they go back and they um, basically hit this rod with a hammer to count how many times mm -hmm. the hammer makes it advance a foot and a half. A foot and um, a half. Is the yeah. spoon also a foot and a half? The spoon is, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been a while, six inches or so, I think, okay. is, what, is what it collects. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it, it collects a foot, oh, excuse a me. Foot. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, so basically um, you're using this to determine both the strength of the soil because it's how mm -hmm. many times you're hitting it to mm -hmm. you know, advance it a foot and a half. Um, and you are you know, also collecting that soil so you know what it is. Okay. And that soil, once you bring it up to the surface, it goes into, from what I've seen, these little little jars and goes back to a lab or? Yeah, I, yeah so a lot of it is field identified. So a geologist or somebody that's familiar with identifying soils can readily see if it's sand. Um, okay. They can see if it's silty sand. Like okay. if you're running your fingers through it and you see like a little uh, trace of the, the dirt that won't kind of come off your hand real easily, that's usually mm -hmm. just an indication mm -hmm. it's silty or sand. Clay is going to be fairly easy to identify as well. Um, you can mold it just literally like Play-Doh, You can and it'll hold a shape when you mold it. So those are fairly straightforward to, to field identify. But when you do find clay or when you find some peat or organic material, mm -hmm. Those are the ones that you want to bring back and test in the lab, uh, okay? Um, because that's going to tell you how much organic material is it under five percent organic? That's probably okay. If it's over five percent, don't build there or yeah. you know do something about it. Or um, you know, with the clay, you know, we talked about in a prior the prior podcast the extremely you know problematic conditions that expansive clay can cause. But not all clay is expansive. It all depends on the minerals in it. So you have to take that to a lab to figure out how much it would swell if it got wet, how much it would shrink if it got dry. Um, so those are those are all tests that are done after the actual samples are collected in the field. I have okay. a, a question, a curiosity on my end. 
you know, obviously we, we know exactly how a sinkhole is remediated and fixed. We drill in steel casing, we pump it full of concrete. Curious when you do find organics in that peat, how is that addressed prior to building without having to excavate all of that out and bring in new fill dirt? So there's a couple ways to do it. One way would be to surcharge it, meaning basically uh, you may see just okay. lots where there's a yeah. big pile of dirt. And you're like, well, that's been sitting yeah. there for two years. Well, uh, what they're actually doing is they're squeezing out that or that compressible layer of organic material and uh, making it so that it won't be an issue for whatever building they're putting there. Again, if it's close enough to the surface that you can just scrape it off and get rid of it, that's a good mm -hmm. way to go. And then the final thing would be, yeah, using knowing that it's there, there's always still a way to develop a foundation that will account for that being there. So it might just be the deeper pilings that you put in there. It may just be a wider yeah. foundation, a footer that you put in there. Um, so all of those things are options. I mean, everything's on the table. But yeah. again, okay. knowing that the problem exists ahead of time opens up your playbook a little bit, right? You can sort of figure out what the most economical way to deal with that issue is versus dealing yeah. with it later. Well, it sounds like if I'm ever building a custom home or a commercial building, I'm getting a soil boring or a soil yeah, test exactly done first right. before I'm building. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I Definitely. Highly uh, recommend it. Uh, the, you know, at least the, the shallow stuff that's yeah. inexpensive yeah. and you'll know for sure. Those are those near surface soils more often than not are the ones that are going to be the problem for your foundation. So okay. at least check those. Okay. So if you start to notice damage around your structure, what should you do? And are there certain requirements that the levels, the soils must meet or what's the process with that? Uh, I'll take that second part first. Yeah. The, the So organics, I uh, mentioned 5%. Uh, so the only way you know that is basically you collect that sample, you weigh the sample when it's still wet, you then you dry it in an oven and you weigh it again. And that hmm. tells you how much water was in it. Hmm. All right. So you do the difference between those two. And then they take that same dry sample and you put it in an oven, you crank that thing up to, I don't know, five, mm -hmm. 600 degrees or whatever. And all of the, the organic stuff in there will actually burn off. Oh, wow. Leaving you only the soil. So you weigh it again at the end, you can figure out the, you know, the difference between those two weights will be the weight of the organics that you've lost by burning it. Um, and that just by just doing a simple percentage, if you have found out that you have more than 5% organics, that's not going to be suitable for, for building, um, you know, any kind of substantial structure on. Um, so 5% is the kind of the, the mark there. And then the clays, there are uh, ways to measure how expansive it is, how, um, you know, what the, how much water it can absorb. And so, yeah, there's, there are sort of parameters there that I think we can all look at as, as certainly a geotechnical engineer can look at and advise what to do about it. Okay. Interesting. Oh, and then the, the damage, yeah, the damage. Yeah. So, you know, what we're looking for typically is a combination of things, right? It's not usually just one thing. Mm -hmm. um, I usually like to ask, you know, are you having any problems opening or closing any windows and doors? Uh, for example, if, a, if a, an opening has gotten out of square, out of level, out of plumb, you know, and it's now becoming potentially an egress issue where you're trying to get out of your house and your door's stuck or your window mm -hmm. won't open, um, you know, that is usually an indication that there's been movement of the, of the building, right? Mm -hmm. On its own, maybe not a huge indication because things can be constructed out of out of level sometimes. But when you're looking at that, you might be looking at also some cracks that have occurred nearby that issue. You're looking at slopes in the floor that may have occurred. So kind of looking at all of those things together and not you can't just focus on just a, a floor being out of level. But when you see a floor out of level and there's separations between the floor and the wall yep. or there's cracks in the wall, uh, you know, that's that's definitely an indication that the building has moved and it's not just some you know, deficiency in the construction. Right. So are some, or actually, let me take it back. How long can soil testing take exactly, would you say? We typically do it as a two-day process. So the first one would be, you know, you, a guy like me comes in and looks at the actual structure, mm -hmm. and then we can collect some near-surface things. I've got this uh, extremely high-technology device called a shovel, <laughs> and a lot of the time <laughs> I can actually just you know, find right away, oh, look, there's a tree root right here lifting the house up, or there's yep. a pile of buried trash here. Um, so that's that's easily done in one day. And a lot of the time, that's all we need to do is figure out the problem, mm -hmm. boom. But when we've got issues where we can't readily identify the issue, uh, we come in for a second day okay. and we will do a GPR scan. We will, um, mm -hmm. and then, you know, investigate where to do some deeper borings to figure out um, what kind of soil is going on under the surface and what, you know, what other hazards might be there. Okay. So it's a two-day process, and then from there, it's just lab tests. 
and then a report. Oh, okay. And that soil study and all that testing is helping you to identify the origin of what's causing the damage to the structure and it's shifting. Yeah, so yeah. as a structural engineer, I can tell you if it's moved, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I've got ways to tell you that. No. Uh, I can't always tell you why. I, mean, I know it's mm -hmm. moved because the ground has shifted, but that's where um, you need to dig a little deeper to figure yeah. out what those issues might be. Okay. And are some areas of Florida easier to test than others, or what about harder? Uh, some, yeah, it depends on how deep you have to go, right? Okay. So certain, so we talked about, um, Miami having, you know, very shallow limestone. You don't have to dig very deep there to figure out mm -hmm. how, you know, what kind of soil you're dealing with. But there's areas near Orlando that you won't hit bedrock with a 150 foot mm -hmm. uh, drill. Wow. Um, and certainly you won't hit it if there happens to be a sinkhole there because you, mm -hmm. you won't find any much limestone at all. Um, but yeah, so there are areas that. Um, you have to go deeper. There's also, it's also more difficult to get through clay. If anyone's ever tried to even mm -hmm. just using a shovel, dig through clay, um, mm -hmm. it's far more um, difficult to get through basically than, than sand would be. So anywhere that's highly clay um, will be a, a challenge for the driller. Okay. And why don't they do soil testings on every house? If yeah. you had to say. Uh, there's not really a requirement. Okay. So building code says you can make assumptions about the soil's, you know, load bearing strength. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if you just look at a map and say, well, this area is generally, you know, sand, generally sand, then you can kind of just look at the building code cookbook approach to it and say, well, this has a bearing capacity of whatever it is, um, right out of, the, out of the code, make those assumptions, design a foundation and move on with your life. Probably not the best way to do it, especially when you've got the hazards that we have in this state. Um, so it doesn't, it's not required. Okay. I'd like it to be required, but you know, I don't write the building code. True. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's why they had a, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of problems up in uh, Spring Hill areas. They did a lot of just slab on grade, no footers, no continuous wall footings. Yes, it was a big sandy sinkhole prone area, but I, I'm a believer that some of it uh, goes into how the foundation is constructed as well. Oh, 100%. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> definitely. So what is the most common issue for foundation problems unrelated to sinkholes? Yeah, I mean, I've, you've heard me talk about clay quite a lot. I mean, nationwide, that's going to be the biggest um, biggest issue. And, uh, you know, again, it, it can lead to settlement of a foundation, but mm -hmm. it can also lead to lifting or heaving of a foundation. Um, and... Even just, I don't know if you've ever driven in ta in Texas, but dr driving on the roads, it's far more bumpy. I mean, these things are getting moved around mm -hmm. quite a lot mm -hmm. whenever they get like a, a heavy rainstorm that a lot of that clay will lift the roadway right up and you get these mm -hmm. big, you know, bumps in the road. So um, clay is massive in terms of just the infrastructure it can affect as well as just individual homes. Okay. And then lastly, when someone is seeing damage to the structure, how does the soil testing or how does the soil test, I'm sorry, come into play? Yeah. So once again, you start with the start with the structure, uh, try to figure out if it's moving. Um, again, a lot of these things that we encounter that people are concerned about really are just other behaviors. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not that it's moved downwards or upwards. It's sometimes mm -hmm. it's just moving horizontally, it expands and contracts. Uh, sometimes it's just a functional issue, right? Like a, if a window doesn't open, maybe it's because the balancer in the window is malfunctioning. It's mm -hmm. just a component failure, not movement of the building. So start with the structure. And then again, um, you know, dig a little around the structure uh, right there while you're there that day, um, if if necessary. Again, we don't even know that it, if it's uh, actually a, a dig related issue or like a, a foundation related issue. So once you figured out that it's foundation related, that's where you you know start those processes we talked right. about earlier, um, and you know figure out what kind of soil conditions we we have in play. Very nice. Okay, that's it. Oh, and to, to, you know, you mentioned certain areas of the state that had, mm. you know, homes that were constructed sort of poorly or not, no good foundations that, you know, you mentioned uh, Spring Hill. Yeah, that's what yeah. I know. I don't want to talk sure. uh, junk <clears throat> about, you know, other areas, mm -hmm. but if you own a home in Holiday, Florida, Pasco County, barely, you know, barely have slab that's at all. Much. It's just yeah, very little much. thin <laughs> slab, no foundation whatsoever. I don't, I don't, you know, sorry if you live there, yeah. but uh, 
yeah, the, those are always going to have issues. Just, you know, most of them are still mm. fine to be fair. I mean, but they, mm. you know, they, they just weren't constructed properly. So issues with, uh, foundations there are more than likely to happen. Yeah. And have you seen any, uh, building code changes since they've were aware of these just slab on grade houses having issues or it's still the same it's still same the same, same. Been the okay. same it's always been the same you're supposed to yeah. be embedded at least 12 inches below the ground okay. um most of those homes there specifically those like fingers of real estate there in in holiday there's mm -hmm. no such yeah. thing it's just right there on the surface there's no no embedment of any foundation so um not sure how they got away with that other than just uh somebody not paying attention in mm -hmm. inspecting buildings uh, back when they were constructed in the you know 50s 60s 70s yeah okay that wraps up our podcast thank you so much to david for joining us once again to discuss this topic it was very interesting make sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel for more exciting content and we will see you on the next one take care mm -hmm.